Good afternoon. Um, oh, hi, John. <laughs> I see some names that I know popping into our audience list. That's exciting. Uh, I'm Katrina Floyd with Trust for Learning and wanted to welcome you and hope you're in the right place if you're here to hear about community responsive innovation, particularly in expanding Montessori, then you are in the right place to hang out with us for an hour and really hear about some really innovative things that are going on in Colorado in expanding uh, Montessori. So I'm going to give one more minute. So we'll start here at about 3.02. And uh, just to let a couple people come in, but really great to see people in the audience list. I'm excited to be hosting this along with Early Milestones and really excited to hear about our, hear from our panelists today. So welcome, welcome. We'll give one more minute and then we'll get started. And Emily, are the um, attendees, are they able to get into the chat? Because it'd be nice to hear from people kind of where they're, where they're from, uh, what may be your name and who you work with and what part of the country you're in. Absolutely. I will make sure that we open up this chat. So it looks like the chat is now open for everyone to participate. Perfect, thank you. And so everyone's aware as well, we are recording this session. And the reason we're recording is that this panel has been accepted to the Montessori event, which is going to be happening here in Denver in March. And one of the things that they're doing to make sure that people can access the event is that they're also going to have a virtual aspect to the event. And our, our presentation was tapped as one of the ones they wanted to have recorded beforehand. So uh, I used to say kill two birds with one stone, but that's not really nice. So now I say feed two birds with one hand uh, so that we can have this webinar to have you all join us and then also get it recorded as well. So welcome, welcome everyone, we'll get started. As I said, I'm Katrina Floyd with Trust for Learning. I'm the director of Idea Learning Initiatives and I'm gonna let, um, I'm gonna hand some time over to Emily with Early Milestones so that she can uh, tell you a little about, about Early Milestones. Hello everyone, thank you so much for joining today. Um, if you don't know about Early Milestones Colorado, we are a nonprofit organization that advances success for young children by accelerating innovation, the use of best practice, and systemic change. Uh, we're so grateful to have been working with Trust for Learning um, for the past five years to expand ideal learning environments across the state of Colorado. So it's been a wonderful partnership. And out of that partnership came sort of this group collaboration. Uh, Trust for Learning and Early Milestones created a Colorado cohort where grantees were given dollars to bring them into further alignment with the principles of ideal learning. And so this conversation kind of happened in a meeting and we thought, wow, this is so interesting. I think people would really be interested in hearing sort of what was going on for all of us. And so that's where we came from. I think if you'll go, Amy, to the next slide, I'll have everybody introduce themselves. And Emily, you're up to my left. Do you want to start? Yes, um, I am Emily Madison. I am the founder and executive director of Montessori Collective, which is a nonprofit organization based in the Denver area. Um, I came to this work because um, I've worked in public education at, for a long time as a teacher and an instructional coach. Um, and I saw a lot of compliance-based education happening, even at the early childhood level. 
um, and especially for marginalized communities. And um, so, you know, I saw three and four year olds coming to the conclusion that school wasn't the place for them because they weren't successful um, in those compliance based models. Um, so I saw a real need to expand um, child centered education, especially in um, underserved communities. So that's what led to the founding of Montessori Collective. So I'm excited uh, to be here today with all of you um, and have this conversation. Great, great. Amy, how about you? Hi, everyone. My name is Dr. Amy Flegg. Um, I am, in addition to being a board member for Montessori Collective with Emily, um, I am on the leadership team for Compass Montessori School. I'm the principal of our ECE through sixth grade campus um, here in Wheat Ridge. Um, and I had the pleasure of working with Emily through my doctoral studies that I just finished up my dissertation this past summer, um, looking specifically with Montessori Collective as my community partner um, and engaging in some work around um, stakeholders with Montessori Collective and some themes from their first few years of being in the community and um, some implications on a larger scale for Montessori in the public sector as um, and you know, in equity and inclusive practice. Um, and I myself also started in a more traditional space of um, education as a teacher um, and through a close friend found Montessori um, in the public sector and haven't looked back from there. Um, I am elementary trained um, through the um, Montessori Institute of, of Atlanta, um, AMI training, and I'm a former upper elementary teacher before transitioning to administration. So it's a little bit about me. Thank you so much for being here and for um, engaging in this work with us. Great. Uh, Tatenda? Uh, thank you so much. Uh, hi, my name is Tatenda Blessing Mochiriri. Um, my pronouns are he, him, his, and I'm the founder and the chief dreamer of Montessori on Wheels, which is a nonprofit here in Denver that seek to expand access to Montessori education by reimagining uh, what par uh, parent partnership looks like uh, in our communities, especially uh, BIPOC and low income. Uh, I came to this work really also um, having taught in both public and private schools and really in different uh, parts of the world. Uh, and around about 2020, uh, you know, during COVID, when everybody was trying to make bread and, you know, look up recipes to uh, bake, uh, I also looked up uh, the gaps within Manas education. And for me, it was very clear that often many times we create schools, micro schools, big schools, charter schools, and nobody really is uh, thinking about exposure, which is very essential to then have most of our Black and parents choose Manas education. Uh, so we are really in the... Um, efforts of trying to uh, bring exposure with the understanding that they cannot choose what they can, uh, they're not exposed to. Um, yeah, and I'm excited to be here and to be in conversation with, you know, my fellow uh, disruptors and innovators within the education landscape here in Denver. Wonderful. Thank you all so much. So we've got some set questions that I'm going to ask each panelist, and then hopefully at the end, we would have time for some other questions possibly. So if you've got questions and you want to put them in the chat, that would be wonderful. But I will, I'm going to start, Emily, with you, and the question will be for all of you, what are some ways in which access to Montessori can be expanded, particularly in underserved populations? Thank you. Um, well, I think, first of all, it's critical that Montessori exists in the public sector um, and, and that it's not a tuition-based uh, system for, for all families. Um, Denver Public School, where... I do uh, most of my work already has uh, five, five schools with Montessori programs that serve early childhood through elementary age children. Um, however, it's not necessarily um, an option for all families to travel across the city to access that programming. Um, fortunately, Denver also has a really strong public preschool program. And so many neighborhood schools have um, early childhood programs embedded within their elementary schools. And those are tuition free for many families. It's, it's based on a sliding scale, but the vast majority of families do not pay tuition for that uh, early childhood education. Um, so Montessori Collective's model is to partner with those um, programs, those neighborhood schools that already have early childhood programs. And we convert one or two existing early childhood classrooms to Montessori. Um, so you can see some pictures here of some of our partner classrooms. 
Um, they all look a little bit different, but they are all beautiful. Um, we are entirely grant funded. And so this transition from traditional education to Montessori is done at no cost to the school. Um, so Montessori Collective provides um, full scholarships for teachers to attend the Montessori Education Center of the Rockies, which is our AMS affiliated training center here in Denver. Um, we also provide a full classroom set of Montessori materials. And then we, um, in addition to that, we provide ongoing coaching and support to ensure that, that teachers feel supported and have the resources that they need. Um, so that model of just starting small by converting one or two existing early childhood classrooms um, allows families to access Montessori within their neighborhood. So they're not having to travel across the city to access a Montessori program. Um, and we've also found in talking to families that they have really strong ties to their neighborhood schools. In many ways, the neighborhood schools are, are kind of the center of the community. Many families have attended that school for generations. And so they're really not looking to go outside of their neighborhood um, to access different programming. So bringing, bringing um, programming to their neighborhood schools um, that offers a different approach um, has been really well received by the communities that we work with. Um, and just focusing on bringing, you know, starting small and just bringing one or two Montessori classrooms um, to a neighborhood school that has been historically um, underserved within a neighborhood that has been historically underserved um, has been really well received as far as a strategy for expanding Montessori. Great, thank you so much. Um, Amy, same question for you. How can we access, how can we expand access? Absolutely. And um, I, I want to share that my perspective is mostly informed by um, the findings from um, my dissertation work with Montessori Collective and, you know, in my work on the board with Montessori Collective. Um, and I think one of the major themes that really arose from the work that Montessori Collective is doing is around um, as Emily was talking about, that engagement with the neighborhood um, schools and that model of um, having this asset-based approach to the existing communities and elevating, um, you know, local knowledge and perspectives and values in those communities in this Montessori work versus, um, I think Tatenda touched on this in his introduction as well, but just around like we're opening this whole charter school or we're opening this whole neighborhood school or this school that we have this model and um, vision for, it's partnering with um, those local communities in that small growth approach. Um, and within then that work is very important that leaders in these both in Montessori Collective's work, but also in Montessori in the public sector are doing things like decentering whiteness as the predominant perspective in um, in Montessori in um, taking a, you know, approach of equity, literacy and open mindedness and reflection um, that those are really values that are part of the work that's unfolding. Um, for instance, you know, with our Montessori Collective work, um, we um, engaged with some really intentional um, work and now it's slipping from my mind. Emily, what is the program that we did with Araceli? The Intercultural Development Inventory. Yes, the IDI um, that really facilitated some intentional dialogue among the leadership of Montessori Collective around our grounding principles and um, the, the lens that we're approaching this work um, and being aware of, um, you know, the, the equity and inclusive pieces to the approaches of, of that work. So, um, how that is shaping decision-making and all of those things. So I think for Montessori broadly, as it expands into, um, as Emily said, more underserved communities or more communities who've historically experienced marginalization that, uh, that ongoing reflection and reflexivity is part of that leadership and work. Great, thank you. Uh, Tatenda, you have some thoughts about expansion, I think? Absolutely. Uh, and mine sort of really uh, stretches outside the brick and mortar model. So I really appreciate the work that Emily and, uh, and Dr. Amy are doing within the systems. Um, I, I sort of have a uh, 
you know, uh, a broader look into uh, uh, how we can do this work uh, outside, uh, you know, institutions where learning usually, you know, uh, takes place. Um, so I, I really come with uh, sort of a disrespect, uh, like a deep respect uh, around the history of education in the United States. Uh, and in Denver, and also like the existence of Monster within that backdrop, right? And understanding uh, how parents sort of uh, relate and interact with schools with Manasa education and their knowledge uh, of Manasa education often within the district uh, or within their community. So I really um, believe strongly in Monasa and Wills that we have to go where they're at and really bring that knowledge to them and that understanding to them. Um, you know, similar to uh, Dr. Amy, when we also did our empathy interviews and our discovery interviews in 2020, what we sort of find out true was that parents um, knew of Manasori, but not really had an understanding of what it was and what they wanted was to really understand it. And a better way to do it is to really go to where they are, be it a church, in a park, at a local school, uh, in nonprofits that are working within our own communities. Um, so we really strongly believe in going to them and being able to uh, innovate within uh, their, their local settings, be it uh, a pop up, you know, a cast, you know, a mobile uh, unit, uh, you know, a bus. Uh, so I really think that we can only expand access when we really sort of deconstruct uh, modern education itself by way of even thinking about the materials themselves, right? Most of our black and brown parents uh, knew of the modern materials as fancy materials. It's one of those, you know, um, a method that was so far behind, you know, beyond their reach. So we really think about what if we um, are trained so much in Manasa education and bring that understanding of what is in the pink tower that makes learning, you know, exciting for your child to understand the, you know, different variations of size. Um, so we really extract that, you know, uh, those elements and, and, and provide that knowledge to them by giving them access to Montessori so that they too can say that they've had access not by way of attending a school, but that it came into their neighborhood, it came into their local settings. So I really think that if anything, we need to start evangelizing Montessori, I do more outreach as a way to bring them into public schools where they can access endless, um, uh, you know, offerings, you know, without having to pay um, to go to a private school. Great, thank you. And it brings to mind how I met Tatenda, and that is in uh, working in a program in Aurora. And I'm going to put in the chat right now, we did a report on culturally sustaining practices in early childhood education. And Tatenda and I had been have been working with the Village Institute in Aurora that's working primarily with migrant families. And so having a lot of um, just seeing a lot of amazing work that you might be interested in. So I'm gonna to move to the second question and Amy, I will have you start this time. So this next question is how, how and why can equity be increased through flexible pro programming options? So I think the perspective I really wanted to bring to this question is around the uniqueness of the um, model of the way that Montessori Collective in particular is is bringing Montessori to the public sector because it ha it does also fill some needs that I know from my lived experience as a public Montessori administrator, but also that is in the increasingly robust research um, field of research related to Montessori and implementation in the public sector um, is around Montessori teacher pipeline and how um, the approach of working with existing educators in these communities. Um, so far, the educators who Montessori Collective has been working with are educators of color who are highly experienced and we're bringing their, really elevating their um you know, again, to that point, Katrina, of culturally sustaining practices, like elevating local knowledge and experience and and celebrating that as opposed to kind of this Montessori as being um, brought to this community. It's, it's doing it in partnership with teachers who are already embedded. Um, and, you know, Montessori teacher pipeline in the public sector is tricky. Each state has different requirements. Um, we're, we're making progress here in Colorado with some alternative licensure options for Montessori credentials in partnership with state teaching licensures. Um, but again, I think this, this flexible approach to looking at bringing Montessori to these communities um, who don't always have access through the kind of a, a back backwards model of what you often see of 
Montessori in the public sector um, is really a addressing some struggles with recruitment and retention of Montessorians um, in these kinds of settings. So um, I think Tatenda touched on this too, how Montessori Collective is really kind of both inside the system of the district, um, but outside the system as the nonprofit who has some flexibility in the way um, we're approaching things. So I think that as well is something that is um, something to look at in terms of other options for bringing Montessori to the public sector and other other spaces in Montessori Collective's continued growth that Emily has mentioned. It's predominantly right now just in Denver public schools. Um, but what does that look like as we continue to grow and look for other partnerships in that kind of in and out of the system framework? So and I, as um, Amy was talking, I put the link in for Compass Montessori. So then you can see how Montessori has worked in a charter school environment here in Colorado. Okay, Tatenda, how about you about uh, this idea of flexibility? Yeah, uh, very, very important question. Thank you for that question. So the way that I think of equity within uh, the work of Montessori and Wills um, is really centered around the idea uh, of advocacy, right? Like what are we doing to make sure that black and brown families uh, have access to Montessori education, not just by way of sending their kid to a school, but understanding what it is, right? Uh, strongly understanding this notion of uh, who their child is as a learner, so that if they really know what it is and they have seen it in practice in their own communities, they are able to go and demand for that within the district, right? Uh, so we really think of equity as empowering our black and brown families uh, with that understanding of master education, how it works and how it's very responsive to uh, you know, to, to, to their children and, uh, and to their communities in general. Um, so we really think of it um, along that empowerment. And I also wanna to add too that um, when we think about equity, we also have to think about how does Montessori exist within our communities, right? Um, again, I keep going back to the history of education, what has happened and how so many of our black and brown families don't really have trust in uh, public education or in schools in general. So how can we bring some of that back into their own communities as we build back that trust uh, so that they can sort of go back into schools and integrate and really uh, uh, you know, trust their local schools uh, and their learning that their children are exposed to uh, within um, uh, the district. And I really appreciate the work that uh, Emily is doing. If anything, it really is uh, pushing Montessori within the public sector that we don't really need to have all the master materials, but the approach and the framework to understanding children and how they learn and also equipping uh, public school teachers with different instructional methods to deliver uh, learning. Uh, so we think of that as an extension to really empower what Emily is doing as we start them off in our own communities. So we partner very well with Emily uh, to really do the exposure first and then sort of ease them into the public schools one classroom at a time, you know. Uh, so that to me, I think is how we sort of uh, think of equity uh, when we really empower communities and when we think innovatively and differently and expansively, uh, not just limited within the school district or within the four corners of the classroom. And it's been it's been really powerful because how the trust got introduced to kind of working with, with all of these wonderful people is that we had that grant and Montessori Collective received a grant to open a Montessori classroom in at Goldrick Elementary in Denver Public Schools. And Emily and I were actually able to interview the assistant principal and her family. And she had a child that was in this classroom. And just to hear them talk about how much that child just blossomed in that learning environment was really, really exciting. And what intrigued me about the Montessori Collective was the flexible way that they go about bringing Montessori into a school, because as you know, we need to work within licensing regulations and all of these others, other do's and don'ts within a school system and within a policy system. So um, Emily, you wanna talk a little bit about flexibility? Yeah, thank you. Um, I think, you know, sometimes we, as Tatenda said, like thinking about Montessori as being more expansive than just living in the four walls of a school. Um, and I think sometimes we can unintentionally limit ourselves by thinking of Montessori only existing within a specific Montessori school. Um, and there are many other ways for Montessori to exist, for example, on a, on a converted school bus like Montessori on wheels. Um, 
but I think also just realizing that we can start really small with one or two classrooms within a school. Um, and we can, that allows more people to access Montessori, um, especially if we focus on those schools within historically marginalized communities. Um, and then with that, that kind of starting small model or that exposure model of, um, you know, bringing Montessori into the communities that gives families the opportunity to advocate for more Montessori at their, like Tatenda was talking about, um, you know, at their school or the district or the state level. Um, and then also, you know, being that, that teacher pipeline piece that Amy talked about is really important and um, partnering with teachers who already are in, embedded in communities, they reflect the diversity of the, of the children that they're working with. Um, they already have those uh, relationships with families. And so um, in all of the partner schools that we've worked with, it, it hasn't felt like a huge change for anybody. Um, it's just been like, okay, now there's a new like curriculum. It's, it, hasn't, it hasn't been a big shift um, from, the, from the family's perspective. Although, you know, it's been positive, but the, it hasn't been a shock to the system. Um, and so I think just working closely with communities, listening to what they want, um, and being flexible and not limiting to, you know, this is how Montessori quote unquote should look um, and, and holding true to the philosophy while still allowing for some flexibility there. Yeah, I love that you mentioned it, about it being community driven because this really is about engaging with the community before, not after and trying to kind of fit a square peg into a round hole, but saying, what is it that you want for your kids? And how can we help that kind of come come uh, to fruition? So to tend on, I'm going to start with you on the third question. And that really is how and why is community engagement critical in creating culturally sustaining education opportunities? I think it goes back to our theory of change, right? Like I said, that they're going to choose what they're not exposed to. So if you really understand what that means, right, to give that exposure so that they can really make choice, you know, within our district here in Denver, we keep talking about choice. Uh, and I think one of the things that I sort of enjoy engaging my friends and my partners in education with is what is choice, right? And who has choice? Uh, so I really think that the work of community engagement really uh, gives us an opportunity to um do well by our communities and right by uh, you know our black and brown uh, families, especially those who have been marginalized within education, within Montessori education often as well. So we really are very laser focused in making sure that they have that exposure. They know what's offered within the district. They know that there is an offering that Emily is bringing into our district and also understand what it is by way of how we then sort of go into their communities. And it is important because um, we are also really informed from uh, this uh, new ways of doing education with families, not to families, right? When we understand that shift that often many times we've done education to them, not with them. Uh, so with them for us, that's really by going into their own communities where they have more uh, strength and power and, uh, and it is to sort of control how they uh, want to welcome uh us and then share uh, their children with us in their community and their history and we share monosation with them and then we find that intersection to then be able to um, uh, bring them back into uh, schools with more agency around advocacy uh, peace. So the how part of it is literally by going into the communities, empower them with knowledge, partner with them, understanding their history and their lived experiences and their uh, experiences within education, and then together going back into you know schools, central office, and uh, build on that advocacy piece, partner with local uh, uh, efforts that are happening within the district, AMLI, uh, Trust for Learning, and, and other um, uh, folks as well who are doing this work. I love that idea of the intersection. Um, that's great. Uh, so Amy, how about you? Why is the community engagement so critical? I actually, I wrote down that, that intersection idea because I think that is something that's so crucial with how Montessori Collective has moved forward this work in partnership with Montessori on Wheels is that it is so important around caregiver engagement and awareness of what this work is. But as Tatenda said as well, bringing community members, you know, assets and strengths and histories back into the environment. And I think that's something in my doctoral work that we really tried to interrogate is Montessori is, you know, it is a curriculum, but it's 
first and foremost, a pedagogy and a philosophy and approach to working with not only children, but their families and, and other humans in this world. And that the core of a lot of our Montessori training and the way that we engage in that work is you know, authentic learning, hands-on learning, um, practical life skills, and ways that you can bring community ways of of what that looks like in the communities you're working with, I think is a really important um, takeaway from this work and continuation of this work. Um, things like you know, the oral story, storytelling and histories that are really embedded in the Montessori curriculum, especially in the, in the elementary grades, um, weaving in community experiences and, and really for Montessori as a whole of looking at how are we reflecting back the community that we are serving in the way that we are enacting this approach to learning and enacting the curriculum. And, and on a larger scale, that's work that Montessorians have been doing of looking at our timeline looking at our charts, looking at the ways that we're delivering um, lessons and engaging with our the learners. Um, but I think having that be informed by the communities we're serving is really crucial and something that um, Montessori Collective, you know, is continuing to grow and, and iterate, but um, is a really great model for bringing that lens of open-mindedness of collaboration and in partnership with the community that's really special. Yeah, I think about that when you were when you were talking, I'm envisioning walking into a classroom and seeing all these kids in there and realizing how how many similarities they have, but also the differences. And so why would we ever think a one size fits all approach would work for everything? So that idea, I, I love that, uh, that idea about working with the community. Emily, how about you? You want to talk about imports of community? Yeah, I think. Amy and Tatenda um, really highlighted a lot of, you know, a lot of the pieces there. I think um, kind of emphasizing the the need to empower families with knowledge. And I think that's why the the partnership of um, Montessori on Wheels and Montessori Collective has been so powerful is because we can engage families in in kind of their their environment, right? Meet them where they are. Um, and, and empower them to advocate for the education that they want for their child within the school system. Um, and so I think families and community members are our best advocates. So the more that we can um, educate them about Montessori and empower them um, with the avenues of ways that they can advocate for more Montessori in the public sector, um, I think that's, that's a really powerful partnership with community and family members. I think that brings up a good Point because I was with a big group of early childhood experts and we really talked about the fact that we really need to be educating not only families but the general public about why early childhood is important and not just that children have quote unquote child care but they had that they have quality experiences and exposures yeah so that really that really makes that really makes a lot of sense so Amy, I'll go back to you. Um, what have been your greatest learnings in in this idea about expanding access to Montessori? Hey, I don't know. One of the big takeaways from my dissertation work that I actually really have brought to my own professional and personal experience here at Compass and honestly is probably a daily conversation is really around interrogating Montessori's um, tendency towards rigidity around fidelity to our approach and to the method and to really look at, yes, this is, this is an amazing, um, again, curriculum pedagogy philosophy that has brought us here today and thousands of people across the country or across the world um, and has been in existence for over a hundred years. Like it, there is so much power and obviously that approach to, working with children and where do we need to be open, be flexible, be responsive to community. Something that was really striking from, um, I think, Emily and Tatenda's work together is just about the like approach to engaging the community in, uh, there's this beautiful story in our work around um, a family that came to one of the events for Montessori Collective and Montessori and Wheels and felt really affirmed and seen because they were able to engage with that work in their primary language. And 
Um, I know that's work that Emily has done with Montessori Collective is adapting Montessori materials um, to be in Spanish, that children can can work with this in, um, again, in ways that they are seen and affirmed in, in the setting because it's meeting them where they are and um, adapting to them, not the children adapting to the way that we want to do things. And I think as a whole, that's a really important thing for Montessorians to hold true that we are following the child is, is a crucial part of what we do. And sometimes we need to, ref the prepared adult and the prepared environment needs to adapt for um, where the children are and where their communities and families are as well. So I think just continuing again, that like reflection and awareness of when can that rigidity butt up against um, community values and needs and culturally sustaining work in in communities. So that was really my biggest takeaway. So I had the pleasure of visiting Compass Montessori, the Golden Campus, and talking with uh, Amy and, and some of her colleagues. And we really talked about challenging this idea of school readiness and that it's not the children that need to be ready for school. It's the school that needs to be ready for uh, children. So I love that you brought that up because it really is about wrapping our arms around each child, each family. And then finding out not what our goals are for them, but what are their goals for themselves and their their families. Uh, Tatinda, how about you? Um, what are your thoughts about about uh, your greatest learnings? Yeah, similar to uh, Dr. Amy, uh, this idea of rigidity. I think what I have learned, what we have learned at Marathon Wheels too, is that we cannot do this work. Like alone, we need to partner with local uh, organizations. You know, you mentioned our collaboration with the Village Institute, um, which really took us a year of uh, learning with them and understanding uh, the lived experiences of uh, refugee women and children uh, uh, in Denver to then understand how we can share Montessori uh, with them understanding how they can understand it from their uh, uh, lived experiences. Because often many times we sort of share Montessori the way in which we were trained in our you know, various institutes and uh, teacher education programs. And we sort of fail to then adapt to our, our own communities. So uh, if anything, we've learned to listen and then to use Montessori as a framework to adapt to then how do we tell the story of Montessori, and we'll, uh, Montessori uh, to bring them in and then sort of uh, work together to understand what is Montessori with your child, with your family, within your community, within your district. Um, so if anything, I think I've learned the power of collaboration. I mean, Montessori Wheels in itself, the formation of it uh, was an offshoot of, you know, Emily's work. We were literally with Emily in a summer of 2020, driving our cars, bringing Montessori into uh, schools, you know, parking lots uh, and thinking about, hey, this is Montessori on wheels. We are literally on wheels. And also we are doing this. So I think that idea of listening and getting that feedback to then inform how we uh, do the work, because I think data is something that is sort of uh, scary to most you know, educators, if not Montessorians. But for us to be able to use qualitative data to inform then uh, how we do our work has been uh, the greatest learning of our, um, our work. Yeah, exciting. I think that's really exciting. Um, so Emily, how about you, your greatest learnings throughout this adventure? Yeah, I think similar to what Tatenda and Amy have said, just the importance of being flexible and adaptable um, while being clear about like what pieces are, of Montessori are non-negotiable, right? Like there, there is a foundation to that pedagogy. Like what, what is it that makes Montessori Montessori? Um, but also understanding that if we're truly being responsive to the needs of children and families, then Montessori is going to look different depending on the communities that we're serving. Um, and so really working within communities to understand, um, like Tatenda said, really listening and understanding their lived experiences and then using Montessori framework to, to meet their needs. Um, but I think sometimes we can get stuck in this um, idea of like, well, this is the way Montessori has always been done in the United States. So we just kind of continue that tradition. Um, so just taking that critical stance of what is it that makes Montessori Montessori and what can we, um, what do we need to hold on to and what can we let go? Um, and, you know, can, Maria Montessori was a scientist and she was continually adapting her method to meet the needs of the children in front of her. Um, and I really believe that she calls us to do the same, um, really centering children and families in the work, but then um, adapting to truly meet their needs. 
Yeah, I think about the years that I was in a preschool classroom, and I can honestly say that no year was the same because the kids weren't the same, the families weren't the same. And so you were kind of continuously having to evolve your practices around this um, new set of little people. So now I get to ask sort of my favorite question. And that is, if you, if you could uh, pick one thing, what would you want people to walk away from this learning or understanding? And I'll start with you, Tatenda. Okay, that, that was quick. Uh, <laughs> but if I could pick one thing, I think it is this idea that better is possible. Uh, I think we have learned uh, within all uh, you know efforts here in Denver that we can do better with our communities. You know, we can do better for our families. We can do better for uh, for for our children. Um, we just need to do it. We just need to uh, be in communities, uh, listen. Uh, and be able to, uh, you know, adapt, right? I, I, I take Montessori as an adaptive pedagogy. That's uh, sort of where I stand with it. Um, and I think for me, that has sort of created opportunities for us to be better um, uh, within Denver and uh, nationally and internationally with the work that we do. Great. Emily, how about you? What's your one key nugget? Um, I think my key nugget is start small. Um, it's okay to start with one class. I mean, that's Montessori Collective started with one classroom um, and, and we've expanded beyond there. But um, I think that allows us to be adaptable because, because we can, you know, just adapt to one classroom at a time um, and just staying flexible um, and above all, keeping children and families at the center of our work. Yeah, that's, that's the thing, right? Um, how about you, Amy? I would say mine is just coming back to that where I started in this conversation and this dialogue is around reflection and reflexivity around privilege and rigidity and just having that openness to continuing to be adaptive, be responsive, um, see the community that you're partnering with and um, interrogating where we may be imposing um, imposing something as opposed to um, adapting and working with um, needs and local just assets and ways of knowing and approaching things. And that really does have a lot of space for that in our Montessori work and um, just continuing to be centered in that space of reflection and openness and adaptability. Yeah, absolutely. I, I'll, I'll, I'll say my, what my nugget, what I've walked away with was this idea of particularly moving beyond this narrative of, of whiteness that has specifically been, been around Montessori. And really it wasn't anything to do with Montessori, but it had to do with the fact that many families and couldn't afford to send their children to places that were offering this. So I know with my work with the trust, really focusing on that idea of public sector. How can we how can we be included in universal pre preschool? How can we be included in in elementary schools within our districts, making sure that our child care assistance programs are working for families so that they have all of these options and, and all of this choice. Um, so that's sort of the end of my planned question. So I thought I would let each panelist maybe make a little closing remark, and then we'll maybe have a few minutes at the end to uh, do some questions. So I'll start with you, Emily. Anything that you didn't get to say or you want to make sure comes across? Um, I think just that idea of being staying flexible and being adaptable. Um, yeah, I think we're we're continually learning and growing and adapting and changing um, in Montessori Collective. And so I just I really appreciate being part of this conversation and um, and everybody who joined us. Thank you for, for being here. Yeah, great. It's been it's been wonderful for me, a big learning opportunity at, right in my own backyard. Uh, see, I'm here in Centennial, Colorado, so seeing all the work that Denver Public Schools has been doing and that Compass Montessori and Montessori on Wheels has been really, really inspirational, and I think we can take a lot of lessons uh, from that. Um, Amy, how about you? I, 
I think one of my more recent takeaways from this work, from my doctoral work, from just being in the Montessori, public Montessori land and partnering with, I'm, I'm a big believer of bringing people together across who are taking different approaches to things. And that was why I was so drawn to being working with Montessori Collective and Montessori on Wheels um, for my doctoral work. I think Montessorians would be very well served by finding more how what we have in common and partnering than by where our differences lie. And that's something that historically has been a challenge in the Montessori community. I really think there's a lot of opportunity for partnership with Trust for Learning under this ideal learning model um, of looking at how can we partner with other approaches to early learning who are taking a whole child approach, who um, part of why uh, Katrina came out to Compass was looking at ECE programs that have um, natural, like getting out in the environment and the, in the world and the community and, and how has that kind of come up against some challenges in terms of early childhood licensing and things. I think there's a lot of work to be accomplished in advocacy um, for approaches to learning with children that, that aren't just kind of status quo, um, as was mentioned earlier, this kind of stand and deliver approach to education that has, um, disproportionately disenfranchised, um, children from marginalized communities and black and brown children. And, um, you know, looking at for opportunities for Montessori to partner with things like trust for learning under those ideal learning principles to advocate in Colorado nationally for ways that we can continue to expand Montessori, but um, work together, not in, as opposing forces or, you know, focus more on those things we have in common to push together. Yeah, super. Okay. Uh, Tatinda, how about you? Final, final words. Yeah, I think one thing that I want to really stress out here is that our work is very messy. Uh, one thing that we often hear uh, from, you know, educators around the world, uh, within the country itself, is like, how do you do this work, right? Uh, and I mean, again, because it really doesn't follow the same principles of a three-hour cycle, a school, right? Uh, so it is really messy. If we are saying that we're taking Manasari, you know, to the streets, we are really doing the streets, you know, uh, engagement within communities. So for some, it could really be the hood experience. For some, it could be a pilgrimage, right? So it is all those things. And I think for us, it gives us an opportunity to really practice observation, right? To understand how we understand uh, children and communities when we observe and also when we listen and then when we respond uh, to your community needs, uh, so yeah, it is it is messy, but we learn a lot from that. We are in the business of outreach, um, so we are not a school. Uh, it, it won't look the same as how most people are exposed to it initially through training or through a school in their neighborhood, a private school. Um, it is really gathering uh, uh, ways in which we can partner, ways in which we can empower, ways in which we can exist within communities. That's great. Um, and I was just going to ask Emily, I was going to try to ask her in a message, but I was sort of curious, Emily, as as looking at this from early milestones and working with all of these um, cohorts, what kind of what your thoughts were around this uh, process with the Montessori Collective. And you can say you can say nothing. You can say nothing if you want to <laughs> put her on the spot. <laughs> Me, Emily, or Emily Madison? You, Emily. Okay. I just thought I would make sure. <laughs> um, yeah, so working with all of our, our, our grantees on different projects to expand ideal learning environments uh, across the state of Colorado was an incredibly rich experience. Um, there's, you know, everyone takes a slightly different approach based on what their community needs and they respond to their community in different ways. And um, so, you know, in terms of our work with Montessori Collective, I, you know, I feel like we had an incredible experience of being able to interview teachers and administrators to learn firsthand about the transformations that were happening in their classroom and for their kids. Yeah, thank you so much. Sorry for putting you on the spot. Um, yeah, and, you know, looking at this from a, you know, philanthropical perspective, really letting funders know that you can do what other Emily said and start small 
And a lot of times we think about, oh, if we're going to convert an entire elementary school to Montessori or Tools of the Mind or Waldorf or whatever, you know, high quality curriculum uh, approach you're talking about, that it's very expensive. But it doesn't have to start uh, huge. I mean, it can start it can start small and and um, it can grow from there. And so if you're a funder that is interested in participating with a program, there are a lot of programs out there that you could start off with a seed and then like the assistant principal from the elementary school that we worked with this past year is she said, we are absolutely going to keep going with this process. And we really saw a lot of incredible uh, opportunities coming out of this. We saw the incredible growth, not only for her own child, but for the rest of the children. And so early milestones and trust for learning are put, putting out a five-year report and sort of the culmination of all this ideal learning work in Colorado. We talk about these, this uh, cohort, we talk specifically about Montessori Collective and we, uh, there's a little bit of that interview in there and you can really learn what people thought about this process of, of seeding these really uh, exciting environments. And we had a couple of, we had a couple of really good comments in the chat. And I don't know um, if you two would be interested in coming off of audio and if they can do that, Emily, is that something that atten attendees can do? But I'd love from to hear from Janet Humphreys and then uh, Mako. I hope I'm saying your name right. Um, had had a really good comment too that um, I'd love to hear. Like Janet, if you there's Janet. There I am. Yeah, I just want to thank you all. I mean, I've been working in Montessori for so many years and learned from a person who lived with and worked with Marie Montessori herself and Mario Montessori. So I, this is so dear to my heart. I worked at Mile High Child Care downtown. And, you know, this is exactly what Montessori has talked about. Obviously, she traveled all over the world and created to tend I loved your framework concept. You know, that, that's the framework that she did. Yes, based on pedagogy and all of that. But how wonderful that we're able to look at this and expand on this. I couldn't be more pleased. And I'm thinking she's smiling as well. Not that I knew her. But, you know, it just feels that way, that that's exactly what the U.S. has needed to do for so long and not be so exclusive um, to uh, pretty much the white wealthy culture. Although I did have my, as a single teen mom, had my son in Montessori. I don't know how I did that, but it was important to me. And he's an amazing human being because of that. So really, um, your work has been uh, amazing. Katrina, thank you, as always, for doing all of the the many things that you do to support high practices for, for children that really work for them. So thank you all. Mako, would you like to come off? Am I saying your name right? How do you say it? Yeah, sure. Thank you. My name is Mako Mokumborero, oh, which is the full name, but Mako is perfect. And uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Floyd, for allowing us to, to talk about these issues from the Monastery Collective, but also just really looking at the Montessori method and how it's working within these communities. I also commend all the speakers who have been giving us context and nuggets of how we can better adapt and use the method. If anything, um, I'm just gathering that the method itself is certainly based on its design and its philosophy, uh, very adaptive. And I think that is, is transformative power. And to then think about it um, in relation to its accessibility then creates a bit of a challenge because if something is adaptable, it doesn't mean that it, that makes it accessible. And so it doesn't make it directly proportional. So I think it's important that we create a certain consciousness around how we look at adaptability as just being one side of the story and accessibility as being the other. Uh, yeah, the other side that requires more intention and more effort because when we make it more accessible, we then begin to see just how far that adaptability and that transformation can go in ensuring that more and more children really experience uh, the power of monastery education and what it can do for them in their societies. Um, that was uh, my comment, but uh, a big thank you to everyone else. Love, love that. Love it, uh, Mako. I really appreciate it. And then actually one of my colleagues from Trust for Learning, um, Jihan, did you want to say something as well? 
I actually had a question um, mm -hmm. and a comment. Thank you so much. Um, it's always so energizing um, to hear other people's experiences about expanding Montessori. Yeah, that's Look at myself that in your question? public Montessori. Yeah. And yeah, uh, I've been um, trying to expand public Montessori in my district in Virginia. Uh, but I do, I do love the idea of starting small, like with a few classrooms, as you guys have been doing and as you suggested. But I'm wondering if you can uh, expand a little bit more on the kind of challenges that you've faced along the way um, with, with following that model. Like when you open a Montessori classroom within a traditional, you know, bigger uh, school, what kind of challenges do you face on the ground, realistically. Um, and I did have another part to that question that I just forgot, but you could start with that. That's a good question. <laughs> that's a really good question. Um, <laughs> yeah. Okay, who wants to go first? That's a great question to talk about our challenges. Yeah, I'd be, I'd be happy to start. Um, I think for us, the greatest challenge has been funding. Um, there's definitely demand. There are schools that want Montessori programs, um, but like I said, we we try to do it at no cost to the school. And so, looking for those those grant funds, Montessori is Montessori materials are not cheap. Montessori teacher training is not cheap. So I'd say that's our our greatest challenge at Montessori Collective is that funding piece. Um, and then I think the other biggest consideration when we work with schools is the desire um, and the Ability of the existing teachers to take on Montessori training um, because that, I mean, that, that teacher in the classroom is the number one factor of success or not. And so, um, you know, we do, we make sure that the uh, school administration is supportive because they have to support it. But then we also, we observe classroom teachers before we um, commit to sending them to training and we make sure that they're really on board. Um, with Montessori and understand the full commitment of the training as best as we can <laughs> explain that to them because I don't think you really understand till you're in it but um, but that yeah having those teachers on board is is the number one factor and there have been a couple of schools that like the, the administration really wants it but they don't have teachers who are fully committed and we just can't partner with them because we have to have those teachers on board. Something that stuck with me from um, part of my doctoral work and interviewing with Emily was um, some language that you used, Emily, around like the stars aligning <laughs> and that it really is. It's it's the right community, the administration, the school, the funding, it, the things kind of coming together. And I think that's something Emily has done so well is, is fostering relationships and partnerships and having a lot of irons in the fire to try to find those I think I said something, well, they're not just aligning. There's a lot of work that's happening that's facilitating these opportunities and and bringing people together who have common visions for education. Um, but I think too, on a really specific scale with Montessori and at least here in Colorado and in the way our public system works is that district schools, district managed schools can have very, very specific requirements for curriculum and and assessment and as you know something as a board we've talked about uh, we've talked about just um for Montessori collective in general is right now focusing on e ECE is um there's demand for high quality early childhood experiences especially with universal pre-k having just really rolled out um but also what does this look like in the long run for the kids um administrators want to continue working with this do we grow into elementary programming and if so you know there are certainly a lot of roadblocks that come with that um and that is why you see montessori programs um on a larger school-wide scale being charters here because we have the curricular and pedagogical freedom to, to go outside of the bounds and the requirements and restrictions of um, district mandated curricula. So I think that's pra pragmatically a challenge that we'll continue to face should that expand into older grades. Yeah, absolutely. How about you to tend out challenges? I think demand has been a challenge. Uh, there's just so much, uh, if anything, there's something in the air um, around innovation. I think parents, communities, schools, uh, people are very much aware that we need to do better. 
and we need to really change ways in which we have done learning. Um, so that has been sort of a challenge to then think about how can we really expand uh, outside of, you know, our traditional train of Montessori to think of uh, Montessori as just not limited to the materials. Because I walk into a public school classroom and I see that they do have materials, they, do, they have blocks, they have all the things that we can sort of really rearrange with intentionality to center a Montessori approach or a framework of understanding how children learn and how they should be uh, exposed to learning. So I think really having to like mind shift uh, has been a challenge to think about. It is not just the materials. We can sort of have the approach exist as we wait for Emily to, you know, bring that classroom within your school. Um, so, yeah. That's super. Um, so I'm going to have Emily Landis. I'm going to have her put in the chat uh, just a very, very brief um, evaluation. It's only got a couple of questions on there really about what you found interesting about the webinar and what do you uh, uh, what other information would you need? So if you would fill that out, that would sure help us out too as we prepare to go forth and do this presentation in, I was gonna say in public, but I guess we really are in public right now, but at, in person at the Montessori event, um, if you have thoughts about how it could have been more effective or efficient, that would be wonderful. Um, so I'm trying to think, I'm going to go through the chat really quick and make sure that I got everybody's, but thank you all so much for being here with me. A special thank to my pal panelists. It's just been a joy to work with you all. And just, boy, if you guys could just spend an hour talking to these guys, the amount of gold nuggets that come out is just, it's just wonderful. So thank you for being here as a panelist, Emily, thank you from, uh, for early milestones and, on behalf of Trust for Learning, I wanted to say thank you as well. And uh, we look forward to seeing you again. Bye-bye. Thank you, Katrina. Thank you.